Good morning and a very warm welcome to our online service here in Regent Street Presbyterian Church. Just a couple of short announcements this morning. First one, the food bank collection this Tuesday the 9th in the church car park as usual from 11 to 12 o'clock. Uh, a quick reminder from last week for the PCI produced booklet uh, for now. Uh, we do have sufficient numbers already to be delivered, but unfortunately at this point in time we are not allowed to deliver them. But once the current restrictions are lifted, uh, we have a copy for every family in the congregation. In the meantime, if you want to have a quick look at the, uh, at the booklet, it is available online, and I would suggest that the best way to see it online is to go to our own church website where David has an excellent link that will take you directly to the, what's the, the For Now booklet. Next Sunday service will be conducted by the Reverend Dr. David Irwin, which brings me to this Sunday, and I am delighted to welcome back the Reverend Paul Dalzell, our vacancy convener, who will be conducting our service this morning. And I'm sure we all look forward to what Paul has to say to us and to gather with him in worship. Paul, you are very welcome. Thank you, Ian, for your welcome. It's good to be back with you again in Regent Street. Many of us are longing to worship together again, to be together, to pray, to sing together. But we fully understand why this cannot be just at the moment. But we also hope and pray that we will not have too much longer to wait. And in the same way, I hope that it will not be too much longer before I can moderate a Kirk session meeting and get to meet and to know the elders, that soon we can discuss the way forward for the congregation to proceed to calling a minister. The reason why we haven't met is purely down to the coronavirus restrictions. But as soon as these are relaxed and we are allowed to meet, then we most certainly will do so. And I look forward to that also. Let us worship God. Brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. We praise God in the opening hymn. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord God, we again bow before you in prayer. And we want to worship you, to thank you for all your goodness and for your love which endures forever. We thank you for that love which you have brought to our lives through Jesus Christ, a love which enables us to call you our Father and to know your fatherly care and provision. But we also remember that as well as being our Heavenly Father, you are also the majestic God, mighty in power and infinite in wisdom. You are holy and righteous, and we are sinners. But we thank you that we can come into your nearer presence, that we can approach the King of Kings and call you our Father through Christ Jesus. We thank you that he is your one and only Son, and in him we know our sins are forgiven and so are enabled to worship you. So, Father, we ask today that you will receive of our thanks for all your love to us and for all the blessings that we enjoy and that we have in Christ Jesus. And even in these very difficult and uncertain times, help us to be open to seeing your hand at work, to continue to trust you and to acknowledge your blessings. Forgive us, Lord, when too often we forget to count our blessings and we dwell on too much, maybe on the difficulties and on the uncertainties. But we thank you that you know and you understand. Indeed, you know us better than we know ourselves and you still love us. So help us now by your Holy Spirit to understand something more of your great love for us. And may we be ready and eager to serve you, devoted to you in our lives, even when the going gets tough. Bless us in this time of worship as we sing, as we pray, as we read and think upon your word. May your Holy Spirit's power and empowering be with us, for we ask it in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we have the talk for the girls and boys. Hello again, boys and girls. It's great to chat to you again this morning. I hope you're keeping very, very well indeed. Now, as you know, over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at the Armour of God series. And I want to test you to see if you can remember the pieces of armour that we've gone through so far. And the way that it'll work, boys and girls, is that I will tell you the piece of armour that we looked at this week. And all I want you to tell me at home with whoever's with you is what that piece of armour represents. Okay, so the first week we had the belt of... Yes, that's right, we had the belt of truth. The truth that is found in God's word. And then the following week we had the breastplate of... Yes, that's right, that was the breastplate of righteousness. Remembering that that is something that God can give us. And the following week we had the shoes of, yes, that's right, the shoes of the gospel of peace, ready to be peaceful in our living when we walk with Christ. And lastly, we had this last week, it was the shield of, yes, that's right, the shield of faith, the faith we have in God. Well, very well remembered, boys and girls. Keep looking at those pieces of the armour each week to see if you can remember them as we go over them. And this morning, boys and girls, I have brought with me our next piece of the armour of God, and that is the helmet of salvation. Now, I'm not going to try it on, boys and girls, because I don't want to prove a certain Ian McDonald right. He's always telling me I have a big head as it is. And I don't want to prove him right because I don't think this is going to fit my head. But why would they need a helmet? Well, people who were fighting in the old days in battle would definitely need a helmet, boys and girls. And I'm sure you know this because of protection. They need something to protect their head when they were in battle. 
and you're already aware of this if you're going to go out on your bikes for a cycle somewhere and maybe your parents or whoever is with you says well don't forget your helmet and they're saying that boys and girls because it's your helmet that will protect you if you have an accident it's your helmet that will keep you safe but why is this helmet boys and girls so important well this helmet represents more than just protection and if you think about it boys and girls there are loads of examples of people who wear stuff on their heads to show their importance for example if you think about it if you were a spaceman you definitely need to show off your helmet you need to first of all wear it for protection if you're going out in space but you'd want to show everyone just how important the job that you do is so you would bring along your helmet if you were showing people that you were a spaceman and in the old days they'd have something a little bit like that as well they'd have a cowboy or sheriff's hat and you've probably got some of these at home yourself boys and girls if you've been playing about the house with them but they would use this to show off that they were the person in charge of that town or that place that they were uh, that they were living in and boys and girls that has continued even nowadays because we still have kings and queens and what do they wear on their heads well they wear a crown and they wear that boys and girls because they need to show the importance of their position they need to show that they want to help the country and to rule over the country that they are in charge of but the helmet boys and girls represents salvation and do you know what the helmet of salvation represents so much more than all of those other things because we know that salvation is the thing that saves us from death and the separation from God and it was made possible because God gave us his only son Jesus Christ and he came into the world and died on a cross for our sins God knew the separation he had from his people because of our sin and boys and girls because his love for us was so strong he sacrificed his one and only son for us so that we could have eternal life with him and sin was ultimately defeated and all we have to do to have that eternal life boys and girls is to live by his word and accept Jesus as our saviour well I hope you've enjoyed today's talk boys and girls we will now go to our next praise
we turn to read from God's Word from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. You probably don't remember, but when I first came and preached in September, it was in Philippians, and we're continuing where we left off uh, last year. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Ending a reading at verse 14, we thank God for His Word. Let's come before God now in prayers of intercession, prayers in which we bring the needs of others and our own needs to God. And we realize that there is so much for which we can pray. And for today, I want to give you just a few moments during the prayer to have a time of silence after each short paragraph to bring what is on your heart to God in prayer. Let's bow in prayer together. Let's all pray. Lord God, as our world continues to suffer because of coronavirus, we pray on for the sick and infected, for those who have been bereaved, and for the many who are anxious. We pray for those who are vulnerable in our society. Lord God, protect our elderly and those suffering from chronic disease. And we ask that you will bless the vaccine to all who have already received it. And that in turn will be a great blessing to our community, land, and world. We pray for our children and young people who have faced so many uncertainties in their education and still have worrying weeks and months ahead. We continue to pray for our government and political representatives. Lord God, give them wisdom in all the difficult decisions they have to make.
We pray for our scientific community, Lord God, and all that they are doing for the good of society. May they continue to know your help, your guidance, your blessing. We pray for Christian missionaries throughout the world, especially in areas with high rates of infection. Lord God, provide them with words of hope and equip them to love and serve those around them. And finally, we pray for so many in the world of industry, in health, education, in many fields that continue to struggle. Gracious God, as each day we seek to trust you, Teach us to be your faithful people in this time of global crisis. Help us to follow in the footsteps of our faithful shepherd, Jesus, who laid down his life for the sake of love. Glorify his name as you equip us with everything needed to press on in doing your will. And we offer all our prayers in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. When I was last with you, we considered the centrality of being in a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. In the first century, the Christians at Philippi were encountering some people who said that as well as faith in the Lord Jesus, they needed to observe certain Jewish rituals and regulations and in particular circumcision. They needed to have these in order to be truly God's people. Paul wanted to underline that being right with God, being one of God's children, wasn't a matter of works and personal effort, but it was all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Lord Jesus who, through his death and resurrection, who brings us into a right relationship with God. Because of him, God gives to us in his grace the gift of righteousness, bringing us into a right relationship with God. And having written all of this, Paul doesn't want to be misunderstood. He doesn't want his readers or indeed others to think that he's claiming that because of Jesus, he is now perfect, far from it. And so as an important follow-up to what he had written, and indeed to what we considered when I was last with you, Paul writes at verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, that goal of perfection. Yes, through faith in Jesus Christ, Paul had been brought into a right relationship with God. Because of Christ, God viewed Paul as perfect. All his sin was forgiven. However, that was not to say that Paul himself in this world had reached the goal of perfection. And Paul makes that extremely clear when he says at verse 12 of chapter 3 that we read a few moments ago, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. And that's the first thing that I want us to remember. Just as the Apostle Paul hasn't and hadn't reached this goal of perfection, just as he wasn't perfect, neither is any one of us. And what the Lord Jesus wants is for us to recognize this, to acknowledge our sin and trust him for forgiveness. And the Lord Jesus promises that he will give to us his Holy Spirit. He will give to us a new life and a new nature. But we must not forget that we are still sinners, forgiven, but still sinners. 
in all of us, there's still that old, twisted, fallen nature. The Bible talks of that old way of thinking and talking and acting and indeed reacting. It talks of that old nature as being crucified. That is, it is in the process of dying, but it is not yet dead. It is crucified, being crucified in the process of dying, but that old fallen nature is still there. Now, there have been some movements of Christianity over the past couple of hundred years that have been called holiness movements. And some extreme forms of these movements taught that through uh, some kind of deeper work of God's Holy Spirit and having a, a deeper experience of God in a person's life, that they could reach perfection in this life here and now. now I think that that kind of teaching causes untold misery and harm, and it doesn't do justice to the Word of God. Remember the Lord Jesus taught His disciples to pray. We've already prayed it. Forgive us our trespasses, our sins. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear here in Philippians that he had not reached perfection. During the lifetime of the Apostle John, it seems that this was probably towards the end of the first century, that there arose some kind of holiness movement, even in the first century, that claimed some kind of sinless perfection. What was the Apostle John's reply to this kind of teaching? Well, listen to his words. He says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, in his first letter, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Paul, when he was writing to the church at Galatia, reminded them of the reality of this continuous battle in our lives with this sinful, fallen, twisted nature. Perfection for the Christian is a goal. It's what each one of us, with the help of God's Holy Spirit, must press on towards. But it will only and ultimately be obtained at the end of time when Jesus comes again and we are completely changed to be like Him. Hence, Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, already been made perfect. Not one of us is perfect. However, two things, of course, are needed. Firstly, that we recognize this and we seek forgiveness in Jesus Christ alone. And secondly, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, then the Apostle Paul, like him, as he wanted to do, so also we must press on. You see, the same Apostle Paul who reminds us in Philippians 3 at verse 9 that we cannot by our own efforts obtain righteousness. We cannot by our own efforts bring ourselves into a right relationship with God. The same Apostle Paul who taught that and stressed that and underlined it is now determined to make every effort to live a righteous life. He says, I press on. These two words, press on, could also be translated as pursue. It involves strenuous effort. It'll not always come easy. The language is that of battle or athletics. It conveys the picture of determination. Our Christian faith is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We must keep going. We must press on. Sport psychologists advise athletes, particularly long-distance long-distance athletes, of the importance of endurance and what it involves. Amongst a number of components that they highlight, three are these, patience, pacing, and purpose. Sports psychologists highlight the importance of patience. I read, they said this, the first rule of running a long-distance race is to acknowledge that the race will in fact be long and hard. If you think of it as a race that is going to be over quickly and without pain, you're setting yourself up for unnecessary frustration. And it's the same for us as we press on in our faith. We need to realize and acknowledge it's not always going to be easy. It's long distance and with patience 
we press on. The sports psychologists highlight that there also needs to be pacing. They write, a common mistake among novice endurance athletes is when they notice they are feeling good early in a long race, they start moving faster, only to implode in the later miles. Veteran athletes, on the other hand, know the importance of showing restraint, even and perhaps especially when things are going well. And so it is with us in our Christian faith. As we press on, there's this danger, especially when things are going well, that we think that we are achieving. Somehow we've done great, we've done well. And we forget to pace ourselves. And most importantly, to remind ourselves of where we actually find our strength. Not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ. We must take time to be still and to know that God is God. Patience, pacing. And then the sports psychologists highlight the importance of purpose. In 2017, Shalane Flanagan was the women's winner of the New York Marathon. She was the first American to win it in over 40 years. After the race, she was asked, what kept her going in the later miles of the race when she was fighting through the proverbial wall that so many long-distance runners hit? She said that she kept thinking about three things. Her husband, who had sacrificed so much that she could pursue her dreams, the women that she trained with, and the younger girls who would be watching on, on television right across the country. She said, I wanted to win for them. Reflecting on this gave me the strength to keep going. The sacrifice her husband made, the women she trained with, the young girls watching on. And surely that should be true of us as we press on in our faith. We have purpose, for we remember the sacrifice the Lord Jesus made for us on the cross to reconcile us to God. We remember our brothers and sisters who are around us, those with whom we, as it were, train, those with whom we serve and worship our God. And we press on together. And we remember also all those who are watching on, those who see us and know us to be followers of Jesus Christ. We want them to see our life as something that is desirable, that they will see something of God's love for them. So we press on with patience, pacing, and purpose. The Apostle Paul knew he wasn't perfect, but he says with great determination, I am going to press on, not in order to make myself righteous, but because in Christ, God has already brought me into a right relationship with himself. And note that Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead. If we're to press on in our faith as Christ wants us to, then it's vital that we don't look back. Paul says, forgetting what is behind. Now, of course, we're not to imagine that Paul in some way forgot about all of God's past mercies. We know that that's not what he means here. It's clear for he's already written about those past mercies, nor would he forget the valuable lessons of the past. It already referred to those valuable lessons in the past here in Philippians. But the kind of thing that Paul wants to forget is anything that would hinder his progress, anything that would distract him from pressing on. Things that we may remember that would hinder our present effort and, and future progress. Maybe it's a, a personal despair, an almost hopelessness over some past sin or failing, or maybe even some wrong we felt that was done to us. Sins of the past, but we should be assured that when we confess our sins because of Christ, He forgives us and He remembers our sin no more. So forgetting what is behind in that sense, knowing that it's in the past, it is forgiven, we press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. We press on to do what God wants us to do. We press on with forgiven 
gladdened hearts, with joy in the Lord to serve him, to perform the good tasks he's prepared in advance for us to do. So we learn from these few verses in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Firstly, that not one of us is perfect. Secondly, we need to press on. Thirdly, we must forget what is behind. And fourthly and finally, we note that all of this effort, all of this straining towards the goal is only because of Christ Jesus. Paul says in verse 12, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Another translation, it can be put this way, I press on to take hold of that because Christ Jesus took hold of me. That's the truth for Paul in his life. Christ took hold of him. If the Lord Jesus hadn't taken hold of Paul, if he hadn't intervened in Paul's life, then Paul would still have been pressing on, but in the wrong direction, pressing on and persecuting the followers of Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus took hold of Paul when he was traveling on the road to Damascus. And on that day, Paul, or as he was known then, Saul, he set out with one aim in mind. He was such a zealous Jew, he was determined to smash this new religion, to get rid of Christianity. But God had other ideas. God didn't say, oh, I'm going to destroy this man for the way he's persecuting the church. Instead, Christ took hold of him, opened his eyes, and sent him out to be a missionary for him. Now, few, if, if any of us, have such a dramatic conversion to Christ. Nevertheless, if you are trusting Jesus Christ, if your faith is in Him, He no less has taken hold of you. And here is our assurance, our joy, our peace, recognizing we are not perfect. We press on, forgetting what is past, and over and above all, we know our assurance is not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus, who has taken hold of us. And this expression, took hold of me, actually implies a very strong and firm grip, one that will not and cannot let go. The Lord Jesus, speaking of those who have believed in him, says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. We press on for the prize that is ahead, heaven assured with God himself, not because of our works or efforts, but because of Christ who has taken hold of us, to whom with the Father and the Spirit be our glory and praise. Amen. We sing the closing hymn. Thank you. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only wise God be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord. And may his blessing be upon you both now and forevermore. Amen.